Good morning and welcome to all of you joining us on our pilgrimage across England. I'm delighted that you all will be able to share in this amazing experience as we explore the sacred spaces related to our faith and to our tradition uh, as Anglicans and Episcopalians. And so we begin our journey here in our sister city of Lancaster and uh, to my right out of the screen shot is the castle uh, of the city, the Lancaster Castle, a, a space that has been inhabited by fortifications, Roman forts, and castles since the earliest times of the Roman presence here in Britain. And then to my right and behind me, or to my left and behind me, is the main entrance to Lancaster Priory. And so, uh, why don't we go inside and check out uh, with Father Chris some of the amazing story and history of this beautiful, historic, sacred space. So you're inside the church, you're outside the church in the original building. When the monastery was built here in 1096, this was built by a man called Roger de Poitou, and he was the cousin of William of Normandy, who was otherwise known as William the Bastard, and he didn't like that name, so he decided to conquer England, and so he could be called William the Conqueror, which he thought was a nicer name than William the Bastard. But that was how he was known before he came to England, and he eventually arrived here and got his new name in 1066. When Roger was given a part of England to be responsible for, he was very grateful because his cousin William said, Roger, I've got something for you. It's your birthday. Have the northwest of England. Oh, thank you very much, Uncle Bill. Um, so he was given the northwest of England for his earldom. And he found that part of his territory which had a very easy to defend hill with a site over a river by the coast, good transport links. The trains haven't been built yet, but they were going to be. And that was where Roger built his castle. And as he built his castle, he also built a priory church with a number of monks who would pray for him and ensure that his soul would go to heaven. I doubt it because he was a very nasty man. <laughs> but Roger was the one who gave this priory its foundation. And he brought the Benedictine monks here and set up a Benedictine priory church. Now, a priory is different from an abbey because an abbey is the number one slot. An abbey has got an abbot who is the boss. A priory has a prior who is under an abbot. So this was a sort of second rank monastic house. And when it was set up, it was set up to provide funding for the mother house, which was in Normandy in a place called Seth, S-E-acute-E-Z. -E so the Priory of Lancaster and all its lands, and it was given huge lands, which went all the way down to what we now know as Liverpool and up to the sort of towns and villages to the north here. So extensive lands, and in those days, all the profit from the lands, a tenth of it had to go to the church. And so it came to us here, but we had to send it to Normandy, which seemed a little bit unfair. But that was the way that things were organized in those days. So that monastery continued as a Benedictine monastic house right through until the year 1430. Now in 1430, um, we had a new house of our royal line. And that house was the house of Lancaster. You've heard of the Wars of the Roses. You've heard of the great division between tribes, if you like, in the English aristocracy. And the Yorkists and the Lancastrians waged war upon each other. And for about a hundred years, the House of Lancaster was the dominant house. And our Lancastrians were the kings of England. So we've got Henry IV, Henry V, Henry VI, part one, two, and three, if you read your Shakespeare. And these were the great Lancastrian kings. And during the Lancastrian period of history in England, 
This city was enriched by their gifts. And so at that stage, this church was enlarged. And it was enlarged to the south. So this nave, which had been from that wall there to the centre of the nave, was extended that away. And so it became quite a square church here. But then, in 1430, it was taken away from the Benedictines in Normandy, and we thought, yay, we'll get all our wealth coming to bring riches to Lancaster. Oh, no. We had to send our riches to London, didn't we? So we were given, instead of a house in Normandy, to a house called the Abbey of Zion in Middlesex. And all our proceeds went there. <coughs> but that was a very rich monastery, and they enlarged even further this church. And now it was enlarged further to the east, and the chancel was built, and the church then took on its present size and shape. So this was where the monastic house of the Middle Ages was built. And it remained a monastic house until our favourite king, Henry VIII. He was a lovely man. <laughs> His mother loved him. His wives didn't. Well, the ones who lost their heads didn't anyway. But Henry VIII was not a friend of the monasteries of England. But in 1430, when this was taken from the Benedictines and given to the Bridgetines, the king then said, this monastery shall from henceforth be the parish church for the people of Lancaster. And so when it was made into the parish church, it changed from having a prior to having a vicar. And 1430 was when the first vicar, still a Roman Catholic, but that was the first vicar established in 1430. And because it was a parish church, Henry VIII didn't knock it down. There were a lot of monastic houses of the same period, some very close to here. And the technical word is dissolved, but it just means that they were knocked down and all their riches taken away. There were monastic houses on the, south, on the north side of the church. They would have been cloisters, they would have been stables, they would have been a fabulous house where the prior lived. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist anymore, so I live in a 1960s prefabricated shed. Um, it's a very nice prefabricated shed, but it is a prefabricated shed. But that was all destroyed by Henry VIII, and the church was intact just as a church to provide pastoral support for the people of this town. It was a town until the 1930s, when it was made a city. But during that time, there was a very special link between the church and the state. The king was not head of the church at that stage, it was still the Pope. Henry VIII changed that, but before then, the church was still very close to the sovereign of the country. And we have a particular link here because John of Gaunt was the son of King Edward III, going back to the beginning of the House of Lancaster. And he was the son of a king, and he was the father of a king, but he was never king himself. But he had a special title. He was the Duke of Lancaster. And he was the person who had inherited from Roger de Poitou, through marrying his wife, Isabel of Lancaster, he got to himself the title Duke of Lancaster and Lord of the Lambs around here. And when he died, the title of Duke of Lancaster went to his son, and his son was Henry IV of England. If you know your Shakespeare plays, he was previously known as Henry Bolingbroke, and then became Henry IV. And he in inherited two titles, one, King of England, second, Duke of Lancaster. And when he took the throne in 1399, he united the Duchy of Lancaster with the royal family of England and he became King of England and Duke of Lancaster. And then in 1999, I'm jumping forward 600 years for a quick glimpse, we were very privileged to receive Her Majesty the Queen 
when she came to the Priory to celebrate 600 years since that acquisition by the House, by the Royal House of England of the title Duke of Lancaster. And when Her Majesty the Queen came, she sat just here. <laughs> You're sitting in the Queen's seat. <laughs> she doesn't mind. She's given you permission to sit here today. So, so, but that is where the Queen sat when she came here for the 600th anniversary of <coughs> the Duchy of Lancaster passing to the Crown. So that's why you see a lot of crowns around here. And I want you to look at the pulpit now. And this pulpit is a very fine pulpit indeed. You can see the date it was made. It's written here in the wood. 1619 was the year when that pulpit was made in the Jacobean period. King James I was the king at the time. Now, on the top of the canopy, of the pulpit, you can see the crown sitting on the Bible, which may seem a rather unusual symbol. The crown on the Bible, the Bible isn't a stand on which you place even a crown. But the reason for that is that King James did something rather important in terms of the history of the Bible. He authorized it to be translated into English, the authorized version the King James Version. And so that symbolizes the authority of the king on the translation of the Bible into the English language. About 50 years beforehand, Wycliffe had been put to death for daring to translate the Bible into English because that meant that the power of the word of God was kept within the church, translating it so that the ordinary people could read the word of God in their own language was a huge shift brought about by the Reformation and the need for the people of God to be truly informed about the Word of God. So that is the symbolism of that uh, crown on the Bible. Let me just tell you a little bit more about the pulpit while you can see it. It moved a lot, this pulpit. It was originally here around this pillar. Imagine these pews aren't here. These are modern. These are only about 150 years old. So before these pews were here, the pulpit was around this pillar, and it was on three levels. We call it a triple-decker pulpit. The first level was the pulpit where the vicar preached the sermon. The second level was where the vicar had his stall, and the third level on the ground was where the clerk was there. And he was the one who made sure that the people didn't fall asleep, and that they made all the responses in the right place. So if the vicar said, O Lord, open thou our lips, he would lead in the singing, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise, and make sure that the services went according to the book of prayers. But then the pulpit was dismantled from being a triple-decker, and that pulpit was placed here on this side. And we've got some ancient engravings which show us the different places it was. And then finally, it ended up here when the church was reordered. But they, we lost the top part of it, the tester, the piece behind, and the canopy, the part above. And then one day, our verger was doing some tidying up in a room in the tower. And he found this dusty old box. And he said, I wonder what's in here. And he opened the box, and there was the crown. What crown is this? And it was clearly the crown that was on the old engravings showing that it covered the pulpit. And so in 1999, when the Queen came, they refashioned the pulpit to contain the original crown on the top there and the Bible and that canopy. And that was rededicated uh, when the Queen came in 1999. That's what it would have looked like originally in the 17th century when that was built, though it was here, not there. So that's just a lovely little story about that period. While we're here in the main body of the church, the Georgian period, the 18th century largely, was very, very significant for Lancaster. That's when the River Loon was navigable and ships were able to dock here in Lancaster and they would unload their precious commodities. 
and their commodities were principally sugar, coffee, and slaves. Mm -hmm. This was one of the key ports of the triangular slave trade, Africa, England, America. And that triangular journey brought huge wealth to Lancaster. And it was at that period that the city grew and a lot of the houses that we will see in the town as we walk around were built during that 18th century, when that was a period of tremendous growth. They actually did destroy a lot of ancient Lancaster to do so. There would have been medieval buildings which were destroyed when the town was rebuilt by those Georgians. But it's a very fine example of a Georgian town based around the harbour and along the riverside. There are some wonderful buildings. We saw them yesterday when we took the coach across to Morecambe and Hesham. Those warehouse buildings from the, uh, from the ships, all their commodities would be unloaded, taxed at the custom house, then placed in the warehouses. So great wealth. And this church wasn't big enough for all the people in the city of Lancaster. And so the Georgians put in galleries. So halfway up these walls, the gallery would have gone all the way from the back of the church right to the east end. Only one gallery remains, and that is the gallery at the west end of the church. So if you can imagine that gallery extending all the way up both sides, right to the far east wall of the church, you can imagine the capacity of the church at that period would have been about three or 4,000, which was a huge building. And for some 500 years, this was the largest building in the northwest of England. And people came here for all sorts of things, for public meetings, for concerts. Have you heard of a piece of music called Messiah by Handel? I think most people have heard of Handel's Messiah. One of its first performances took place in this church in the late 18th century, when people from a couple of little local towns called Manchester and Liverpool, you might have heard of them, um, they all came together, an orchestra and a chorus, one of the first performances of Messiah in England here in the 1780s. So that shows how big it was. The next century, the 19th century, that saw the beginning of the huge civic buildings in the cities of England. Big, big scale town halls, city halls, concert halls, even new churches and cathedrals, like Liverpool Cathedral, which is one of the largest in the world. Huge. This would fit into a small corner of that cathedral. But here now in, in Lancaster, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself because that's the Georgian period. And then the Victorian period saw the introduction of these pews. But let's just go back for a moment to the medieval period and the wonderful monastic tradition and what they left us. So in around 1342. And so they are pretty ancient. They are made of English oak, not the ones that you're sitting on. These are Victorian. The, 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 these are modern. Uh, and, and I'm sort of fighting a campaign to get rid of them. But the ones at the back, the ones that you're looking at there. So these are the medieval stalls built in 1342. Now, if you were born in around 1300 in Lancaster, there were two terrible things that happened in your lifetime. First of all, in 1320, the Scots came. <laughs> now, I, I'm a Scot and I love the Scots, but these weren't friendly Scots. And um, these were Scots who burnt the town down. They wreaked havoc here. And certainly, there was nothing in the church that would have escaped the Scots. So we know that it was built after 1320. 1349, was a terrible year for all of England, and especially for Lancaster, because that was when the Black Death came, the plague which took well over a third of the population. And after the Black Death, 
the style of architecture and decoration changed completely. There was no longer anything that was in any sense flamboyant or highly decorated. So we know that these stalls come from between those two periods. And we believe that the 1340s was the decade in which these stalls were created. This was the time when it was the Benedictine Abbey, and it was rich enough to be able to afford the most highly decorated choir stalls in England. It's not me saying that, it's the key architectural historians like Nicholas Pevsner, Simon Jenkins, those who've written the books on the history of church architecture. They regard these as the finest example of craftsmanship of this time. Let me try to explain a little bit about what you can see. If you can look across yourselves, then because they're more or less the same, though each stall is unique. The pattern, the design, is unique to each stall. The craftsman who created it, we believe, was traveling with the armies who went on the Crusades, who went to the Middle East on the Crusades, which were at the beginning of the 13, 14th century, the early 1300s. And we think that because the style of these arches is unique. In England, we have never seen that type of design, which has got the point and then the curve. Now, what I normally say here, I'm going to test on you. What I normally say is that that is called an OG arch. And I say it's called an OG arch because that's what Americans say when I tell them how old it is. OG. Do you get it? Does that work? Yeah, the English people laugh when I tell them that, so I'm, I'm not going to spare you, I'm afraid. I'm embarrassed to say that. But that is called the, the OG arch, with the point and then those curves, the double curves. And that was unique to Islamic architecture in the Middle East. And clearly the craftsmen saw that when he was in places like Damascus, Baghdad, and the Holy Land. The arches, the points, the curves, very traditional Islamic style. Similarly, uh, Islamic art did not allow the portrayal of anything living. So no faces, no human <coughs> representation at all. But he didn't have to follow those rules. But what we have here, you've got the arches and that geometric pattern which filled the OG arch, and then a beautiful tracery of leaves and highly decorated foliage around those uh, perpendicular canopies which surmount each choir stall. And these are the stalls in which the monks who said their prayers daily here would have sat. There's another feature about these stalls which people love to go and look at. And I have to give you a warning here because this is explicit, adult-only content. <laughs> okay? The misericords are a unique feature of the art of medieval choir stalls. You didn't sit very much for the services in the church. You had to stand. You had to go through all of the psalmody, and it took a long time. And some of the monks were getting a bit on, and their knees were getting a bit feeble, so they designed a way of actually turning the chair up so they could just rest their bum on the seat whilst taking the weight off their knees and they could, and uh, Stuart's demonstrating it now. He's, he, he's not really standing, he's, he's taking the weight off and he's resting his bum on the uh, misericord. What the monks didn't know was that the craftsmen were carving detailed images underneath the seats which were only visible when you turned the seat up. And the health warning I have to give you here is do not look at this stall here. <laughs> I said do not look at this stall here because the misericord that's underneath it is extremely rude. It is medieval pornography. It, um, it depicts an angel doing things that angels ought not to do. And, 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 and my mum would have said it would have gone blind if it continued doing it. <laughs> but the point of all that is the suggestion that the craftsman who knew the monk who sat there, he would say, that monk is a right old... <coughs> <coughs> 
So, so we think that these misericords were created by the craftsmen, almost designed to reflect something of the character of the monks who sat there. There are some that are pious, and maybe the monks who sat there were known to be the really holy ones who were there, whereas others were the other variety of monks, and there were certainly those. <laughs> but here, the church is divided into two. We're here in the monastic part of the church. There may well have been a screen here. Possibly these two sets of stalls, one of them is the prior stall, and those would have pr probably been facing to the east with their backs to the church, and there may well have been a doorway there, or even a rude screen here, which is a wooden screen with a cross on it, which is common in many medieval churches. But there would have been a separation between the monk's part and the people's part, and where Stephen and Barbara are sitting, that's where the hoi polloi would sit. That's where the, the, the common folk would say, hello, common people. <laughs> so we're here in the monastic part. And the most important part of the monastic church was, of course, the high altar. And that is more or less where the monastic high altar would have been placed. It's been in different places. and We've had several reorderings of the east end of the church. But that is actually quite likely to have been the site of the medieval high altar. There are also other chapels behind it, and we've got the chapel of St. Thomas of Becket on the south side, and the chapel of St. Nicholas on the north side of the altar. There, was, there were other buildings which we call chantry chapels, and a chantry chapel is built by an individual who wants his soul to be prayed for. And so he builds a chapel, gives a lot of money to the church and says, please make sure that you pray for me in perpetuity to get me out of purgatory and into heaven. That's the medieval theology that they believed in. And so there were certain chantry chapels around where they were endowed for prayers for an individual. You will see them in cathedrals where great aristocratic people, even kings and queens, would have chantry chapels where they would pray for the repose of the soul of that individual. But here we see the rough shape of the uh, monastic church with the high altar. The stained glass here is not particularly great quality. It's very colourful and when the sun does shine, the sun does shine here sometimes. <laughs> not very often, but when it does, we really appreciate it. And oh, we're really getting a little bit now. When the sun shines through the windows, it does give the colour to the flagstones and to the pillars of the church. And you can then appreciate the colours of the stained glass windows. There's a local firm of stained glass manufacturers just around the corner, and they did some of the windows that we've got, and I'll show you them in a moment. But here we are in the centre of the church. Other things I want to point out to you, above you you've got these three candelabra, which you can see, one just above the communion rail, one here in the middle of the uh, choir stalls, and one in the main body of the nave. These, uh, we believe, were made in around the year 1610, and so they're uh, reasonably old. They were given to us by our Member of Parliament in 1710, and they were about 100 years old when he gave them as antiques. William Heesham was the name of the Member of Parliament who gave us these candelabra, and they're very, very fine indeed. And for special occasions, we light these candles. They are real candles. They don't come down on a rope. The vergers love it when I say, can we light the candles? Because they've got to get on top of tall step ladders and light them um, at the same level. So it takes forever to do it. But we do light the candles for the special occasions. It was a semi-special occasion this morning. You should see us when we're really special. Then we go to town. <laughs> and the other thing to point out is the organ which you can see on the west wall. Uh, you heard it this morning. Uh, that organ has been there forever, well, since 2012. So uh, that was installed just four years ago. Before then, the wall was empty. And it was just the stone wall. There had previously been an organ there, we think, in the 18th century, but that was taken down and another church received that, and we built the organ here in the North Choir Isle. So we've got two organs, but we had for a while, uh, in, in the 60s and 70s, they thought that the 
new advances in technology meant electric organs was the thing. And we wanted to have an electric organ, because that was modern, that was trendy. And we got an electric organ, and it was crap. Sorry, it was, it was not very good. So, so we, we, you can delete that bit from the video. <laughs> Edit it out, there's a chance. So we decided that the church needed a proper pipe organ, rather than um, uh, something which was slightly more sophisticated than a toaster. <laughs> And, and, and so we raised enough money to be able to find a Willis um, organ from about 1900, a great English organ maker, and a Harrison Harrison organ, uh, again from about the same period. And so these two organs were installed in the Priory. There is one console which Ian, our organist, who is here with us now, um, is sitting at, and, and that is, is over to the north side. And that console will move to the centre of the nave when we've got organ recitals. And you can see the, the frantic stock pulling and the, and the feet going hither and thither. And we have some tremendous recitalists. And we're very privileged that Ian, who is our own organist, is really skilled and has got the grips of this organ and gives us some amazing sounds and tone colours from it. One new feature... We didn't hear very much this morning, we might hear maybe some this evening, that when this was built, um, that we were very, very privileged that Her Majesty the Queen, as Duke of Lancaster, gave us a set of stops. That she gave us something which we call the Duchy of Lancaster Fanfare Trumpet. Mm -hmm. And maybe before we leave, Ian might give us a quick <laughs> blast on it, just so you know what that sounds like, as, as Ian is, is here with us now. And that's a great sound of a fanfare, because we do have big state occasions. The High Court judges come here every year, all their wigs and all their robes. It's a great spectacle and we have lots of uh, occasions. We, we do have the Queen come from time to time as Duke of Lancaster and big civic occasions when the church is filled and the organ just makes a wonderful sound just to lift our spirits and help us sing God's praises. Because this is, of course, a church. It is a living church. People come and my heart sinks when people say to me, do you still have services here? <laughs> That's what this place is for. It's for the glory of God and it's for the uh, serving the community around which um, people live. So we work to support the community and our mission strap line is to be a welcoming, inclusive Christian community serving the people of Lancaster. That is what we see ourselves as being and doing. So that's the little introduction to this part. Just some of the other things while we're here. Um, you can just see this stained glass window here, um, just in, in the St. Um, Thomas Chapel. <laughs> and, and that is a beautiful window. We have one very famous uh, man who was born in Lancaster and attended the school here. The school was originally just on the other side of the church um, where we were for the uh, hog roast. And the master of the school saw that this boy was exceptionally bright and felt that he needed a good education. So using the contacts he had, he got him a place at the University of Cambridge and from there he went to, he was at Trinity College as a student. He won all the prizes there and eventually ended up as the master of Trinity College Cambridge, which is a very, very senior post in the English educational system. That was at the beginning of the 19th century. <laughs> His name was William Hewell, and if you ever go to Cambridge, you'll see lots of Hewell streets, Hewell courts, <coughs> things named after him. He was a man of extreme intellect, and he was a polymath, but most of all, he was a scientist. Well. He was only a scientist after he coined the word, because he was the man who created the word scientist. He also created the word physicist. Anodes, diodes, and lots of other terms he gave the names to. He worked with other people you might have heard of. Have you heard of Charles Darwin? Uh, Babbage? Um, Herschel? He was the Astronomer Royal who discovered uh, Uranus and various other things. So he was part of the absolute intellectual powerhouse of the early 19th century. And he was a Lancaster man. And that window there um, 
depicts the seven days of creation as a tribute to William Hewell, Lancaster boy, master of Trinity Cambridge, and hugely respected scientist and polymath. Now we're going to go to the next and final station of the Priory Tour. And this is the Regimental Chapel. And this was built in 1904. What they did was that in 1904, they felt that the regiment of the local army needed a place where they could remember those who died in battle. And this was at a time when there'd been a significant war, which we in England know as the Boer War or the South African War, the colonial wars in, in South Africa. And many people from this region died in that war, and so they wanted to build a chapel to commemorate those who died in that war. So what they did was that the wall of the church, which was here, they pushed out 21 feet and rebuilt the wall here. So this was the churchyard <coughs> until 1904, but only when they pushed out the walls to create this new chapel by building this um, roof here, the west wall, and this east apse. So this was built as a memorial chapel for the Boer War. But of course, not long after that came the Great War. And that was a very significant time for, of course, this region and other parts of the country. There were great calls for people to go to war and lots of propaganda. You could not stay in England if you were a man fit and able to serve because you were given all sorts of abuse by local peoples if you were a coward. The white feather and all of those things happened. So huge numbers of men went to war and they came here before they went for their prayers and for special services before they went down the path, and we're going to go that way now, to the railway station where they got on the train and that, that took them down to the ship and they crossed the sea and over to the Western Front. And we're commemorating the centenary of the Battle of the Somme at the moment where vast numbers in the first day, I can't remember the numbers, 9,000 died in the first day wow. of, of that battle and so a million died in the month-long Battle of the Somme. Huge, huge uh, numbers. Um, and it, 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 one, one of the stories that people tell me that if you were standing in London outside the Houses of Parliament, and if there was an army parade marching past, six abreast, then if every soldier who died in the, from the British Army in the First World War was marching past you, as the first one arrived in the Houses of Parliament, the back end would be in Durham, which is about 250 miles away. So that gives you a visual image of the vast numbers of British soldiers who died in the First World War. Tremendous number of casualties. And so this chapel, having been originally built to be a memorial to those who died in the Boer War, then became a memorial to those who died in the Great War. And the west window at the back of the chapel was put in as a memorial to the fallen of the Great War. In the centre you see Christ in glory, and on the um, south side, um, my left as I look at it, it's Roger de Poitou, who was the original founder of Lancaster, and then John of Gaunt, who was the first Duke of Lancaster, and the angels there. And then if we look now, I'm just causing Rob to swim around on the yes. side, I'm sorry. <laughs> and here at the east end of the altar. Um, oh, sorry, by the way, at the back there was something at some point. <laughs> here at the, at the east end, the stained glass windows here, these depict the soldier saints. In the centre you've got the Archdeacon, I nearly said Archdeacon, the Archangel Michael, who is the prince of the um, armies of the heavenly host. And then to his right is St. George. St. George you normally see carrying the white flag with the red cross. On this occasion he's carrying a red flag with the three lions. 
and that is the banner of the Duke of Lancaster. So we know that St George is a Lancastrian. The Yorkshire people who come here don't like that so much. <laughs> St George was a Lancastrian. Then on the right it's, it's St Alban, who was the first martyr in Britain. He was a Roman soldier who was converted to Christianity and was executed for his faith during the Roman time. So in the second or third century, St. Alban was our first martyr. Wonderful. Well, do give my love to the Dean of St. Alban's if you, if you happen to see him when he's there. So the, um, the, the martyr there, St. Alban, and St. Longinus. I don't know if you're aware of St. Longinus. He was a centurion who was standing at the foot of the cross when Jesus mm -hmm. was crucified and pierced the side of Jesus with his spear, out of which flowed blood and water, and he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. You know the story about John Wayne when he was acting in the... He played that part in the film, The Greatest Story, and the director uh, was, was trying to encourage him to be more respectful. So he says, so, John, can we have more awe? I said, okay, truly, this was the Son of God. Yes. <laughs> You'll get it eventually, don't worry. <laughs> so the, the Longinus was a centurion who pierced the side of Jesus and said, truly, this was the Son of God. And the story is that he became a Christian and a disciple from that moment on. So he's revered by the Eastern Church as a soldier saint. And so he is there gazing on the cross and with the sword tipped in blood, the sword which pierced the side of Jesus. Now the other thing, and this is going to cause Rob some more uh, mishap, mishaps, uh, the important thing here is the ceiling, if you look up. There, that is. <laughs> here we've, we've got the regimental colours. Now the colours, uh, woe betide anyone who calls them flags. <coughs> flags you put up on a flagpole. A colour is what you carry into battle. And when you are a regiment of an army, you're given your regimental colours by the king, the queen, the colonel-in-chief, or whoever is in charge of the decision to send the army into war. And the colours are given, and that is what you protect with your life. If you lose your colour, you've lost the battle. That is the significance of these colours. Now, once the colour has done its duty, it served its life. It's not destroyed, they don't put it in a cupboard away. It's called laying up. And so these colours have been laid up here, so they give them to the church and we keep them forever. And so these colours have been placed here, they've been given to us by the regiment and we keep them here and will do so forever until they are no more. Now, some of these are extremely important, and this is the most complete collection of regimental colours that you will find anywhere in the country. And these are from the local regiment, which was called the King's Own Royal Regiment of Lancaster. <coughs> that then became a part of the King's Own Royal Border Regiment, and then finally the <coughs> Duke of Lancaster's Regiment. But the, the Battle of Waterloo, is one of the most significant battles in British military history when the Duke of Wellington beat Napoleon and the standards there are those colours that were carried into the Battle of Waterloo. Into the Crimean War, the Indian War, the South African War, many of the colonial wars are the uh, tokens that are above you and the names of all the battles are written on those colours. So they are a really significant link to the military history of our country. Yes. Where were these kept before this 1904 edition? The regiment held them themselves uh, because there wasn't anywhere for, for them to go. So when this uh, chapel was built, they said, please, can this be the, the repository for our regimental colours? So they came here then. The colonel-in-chief of the regiment has been the, the king or the sovereign. So here is a memorial to King Edward VII, who was the colonel-in-chief of the king's overall regiment when this chapel was built in 1904, and that was made as a tribute to him. The other thing I just want to point out while we're here, here in the sanctuary you see these four <coughs> brass crosses, and those were given to us by the regiment, 
And this is from a, um, a little war that was not particularly glorious, I have to say. This was from the Abyssinian War of the 1860s. What happened in, in this war was that the Emperor Theodorus, who claimed descent from King Solomon, he was the king of Abyssinia, which we now know as Ethiopia. And he was having trouble, and he was a Christian king, and he was a Christian kingdom, and he was having troubles from the neighbours in the south, who were Muslims, and they were coming up and they were fighting battles to try and take the territory which the um, Abyssinian emperor was holding. And he wrote a letter to Queen Victoria saying, please, can you send your army to help us stave off these invaders from the south? He never got a response. So he invited the British ambassador to visit him in his palace. So the British ambassador went to see him. And um, the emperor said, I've not had a letter from the queen. And the ambassador said, I'm sorry, she's very busy. <laughs> said, well, OK, in that UK case, you can stay here in my palace as my guest until she responds. <laughs> <laughs> so that was not seen very favourably by the, the Ministry of War, as it then was in Queen Victoria's government. And so rather than sending an army to help him, she sent an army to get the ambassador out of prison in the palace. So the British army arrived with all its Gatling guns, its machine guns, and then the Abyssinians were there with their javelins, and you can tell the, the result. The emperor was, uh, went to a mountain retreat called Magdala in the mountains of Ethiopia, and there he was hiding away, but the army found him, and the colonel commanding uh, the British Army gave a terrible order because he was in, a, in Magdala, which is a place of huge history of Christian faith in Ethiopia. The Ethiopian Christian Church is 2,000 years old. I don't know if you know the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in the Acts of the Apostles, and he took the faith in Jesus Christ to the people of Ethiopia. So it's a 2,000 year old history, and yet the general commander of the British Army commanded his troops destroy everything you see or take it away if you think you want it. And so these crosses were actually looted from churches which were destroyed by the British Army in the 1860s. So this is something of which we are acutely embarrassed now, but they were given to us and we use them and we hope that there's a time when we can actually do something positive for the um, Ethiopian church as restitution for that appalling act of cultural genocide and violence that took place then at the hands of the army. That was 130, 40 years ago. We can't change the history, but we've just got to own it and repent of it to an extent. That's a very brief history of, of the church and the chapel. Um, before we leave the church to go on our walk round town, have you got any questions about the church that you'd like to ask me, and I'll do my best to try and answer. This box here, this is the, uh, the shrine which contains the names of all those who died. So it's a very fine uh, book with the pages are in, in, in lambskin and, and the uh, calligraphy uh, holds the name of every soldier from the northwest of England who fought and died in the First World War. And there are thousands of names here. And every um, month we turn the pages, a representative from the army comes, and we have a ceremonial turning of the pages to mark the uh, continuing remembrance of those who fell in the war. So this is our book of remembrance from the First World War. And we also have a similar book, a roll of honor, from the Second World War. So those are our books of remembrance, which we keep here in the shrine. Any other questions? Yes. This is on the town in general. Uh, Lancaster uh, has a sister city in, York, in, uh, in the USA called York. And, yes. Uh, I was looking for your perception here in England. Which of the two cities has become the predominant? In England, it has to be York. Uh, the Wars of the Roses was won by the House of York. 
and they became the dominant house thereafter. Um, York was also the centre of Roman Britain. Emperor Constantine visited York. He should have come to Lancaster, but he didn't. Um, his tour guide got, got lost on the Pennines or something. But, but, but York was the centre of the, Roman, um, um, the Romans in Britain. And the Minster, which is one of the greatest buildings, it's the greatest achievements of English ecclesiastical architecture. You will see that tomorrow, and you will be amazed at the splendour of York Minster, the detail and the intricacy of the carvings, and the fact that they could achieve <coughs> such a wonderful, colossal building um, in the early years of the, um, uh, after the Norman Conquest is astounding. You will love York and York Minster in particular. So yes, York has become a much, much bigger and more important place. We became uh, an industrial town, a port, and now we have become a university city, um, and that's now what's uh, the history and the modern life as a university town are the key factors in the life of Lancaster today. Thank you.